and welcome to BFAB. I'm Margot Vigent, and I'm here with the third of our three pedagogy videos. In the first video, we explore what making is, where it happens, and why you might want to use it in your classroom. In our second video, we looked at some specific examples of how other folks have used making in their courses, scholarship, research, and outreach in order to involve students more deeply. Now it's your turn. In this third video, we will examine how it is you can develop your own project for use in your makerspace with your class outreach or scholarly work. I'm here in Bucknell's flagship makerspace, the 7th Street Studio again, with the laser cutter and the vinyl former, just to kick us off as we adventure into our last set of slides. So let's get to it. Let's focus on you designing your own uh, uh, class uh, project for use, and remember, could be class, could be outreach, could be scholarship, for use with your students. So our overall approach here is to be first focused on educational objectives. And I put that in bold to remind us we need to know what we're trying to accomplish in order to be sure we're going to accomplish it. You probably know your educational objectives because you had to put them together for evaluation or assessment or uh, the accreditation of your program. But in case you don't, maybe you want to hit pause, go off and find uh, or create your educational objectives to know what it is you're going to try and accomplish with this maker project. Once you have that, you're gonna brainstorm on a problem that creates the conditions for students to engage deeply with those objectives. So you're teaching a course on CAD, you want all the students to practice creating something that uh, in three dimensions that has a hollow shape in the middle uh, so that you know that they have mastered that part of CAD. For example, so you could come up with a problem that uh, really encapsulates, really forces the students to come to terms with doing that by, for example, asking everyone to make a sculpture within a cage. Three, you uh, need to consider how building a practical prototype would help. Not every class project needs a physical prototype. There's lots of good stuff you can do that remains theoretical or is uh, too difficult to bother. You probably, if you're in chemical engineering, you probably don't want the students to physically prototype a multi-million dollar petrochemical plant. It's not practical or safe at the very small level for most students most of the time. But if you are working on the CAD project, like I said, where you want the students to create something within something else, a physical prototype can really help because it's much easier to make that happen in a drawing on the screen than to realize that in a physical way, even with 3D printing. And getting the students to connect that theory and that practice can be a valuable outcome in and of itself. So in that case, a physical prototype would help. And then, as part of our overall approach, you should become familiar with the tools that are available. Uh, and really think through and reflect on what is possible, how long it takes, um, and what your constraints, where you are, are. So, for example, if we're going to do this 3D printing thing I just mentioned, well, it helps if you have 3D printers. And it helps if those printers are accessible to students outside of just a few set hours a day. And how big is your class? And how many 3D printers do you have? And how much does it cost to use them? All of these things are constraints that you should keep in mind as you design your project. That was a bit of a downer, so let me once again uh, lift you up by saying making does have some real superpowers educationally. There are some ways this can get students fired up that are really hard to attain other ways. It can inspire curiosity in the students. It can really encourage them to bring in their other coursework or previous coursework into your class and put it all together. Uh, it lets them practice value creation. It lets them practice appropriate disciplinary communication. All sorts of good stuff you can do by having your students work in the makerspace. We have a website that accompanies this series of videos. 
And in that website, there is a handout for you to download. If you don't have it already, I encourage you to download the PDF of the uh, pedagogy worksheet. On that worksheet, it'll take you through our several steps to develop your own process. And I'm gonna give you an overview of this process right now. So following our four earlier steps for the guidelines, we're first going to start with the idea of you imagining a problem. Well, we start with the idea of you having an idea what your course objectives are in general, but imagine a problem project or product that incorporates course concepts and making. Start out with some good old school uh, brainstorming. And remember, you don't have to come up with all of this from scratch. If you look at some of the resources cited in video two of pedagogy, you may find that other people teaching similar topics already have created some uh, maker-inspired teaching materials. You don't have to use exactly what they've uh, done, but it can be a really good source for inspiration. And then we'd like to take you through our process to, of making sure that you have considered everything and developed a really robust assignment project for your course. These steps may be done in any order and should be considered iteratively. They all influence each other, but I am going to talk about them in an order because, you know, we are in linear time here. So first up, once you have a vague idea of a problem, a PBL exercise that you think would be a good fit for your class, you want to connect it to your course objectives. Do you hit a number of important course objectives when you're doing this? Does this enable you to have bonus additional course objectives that you hadn't been working on before? Um, if there's no or just one course objective that you can hit with your maker project, you might want to consider moving this to be outreach or to another class where it is a better fit. But really, you want to be able to hit two, three, four course objectives in a good PBL maker project. Moving along, you also want to reflect deeply on why the physical prototype is appropriate. Remember, sometimes it won't be. Um, that doesn't mean it's not making. If you have the students doing a cool uh, programming project or prototyping an app, that's still making, that's still prototyping. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is if the making really adds to the furthering of your course objectives, or if you, and especially the students, will just see it as an add-on. Let's imagine you're teaching a class that has a well-established laboratory, and maybe it's fluid mechanics. You could ask the students to use a 3D printer to print their own pipes. If your course objectives include using CAD to say draw a pipe or uh, having students use say a tool like Comsol to predict friction factors in unusual pipe shapes and then match that with physical reality by creating those unusual pipe shapes and measuring pressure drops, then you should be golden. But if all they're doing is 3D printing the pipes to make the same pressure drop experiment that has otherwise been used for the last 50 years, does that add anything? Think about it. Maybe you have a goal of introducing students to the makerspace and encouraging them to learn about 3D printers. So yeah, but if that's not one of your goals and pipes are readily available for purchase, it's not all that clear why you would want to bring the makerspace in. So make sure that the making turns out to be educationally vital. It moves the project forward um, and it moves the learning forward before you incorporate it. And by the way, there's lots of awesome making projects you can do in fluid mechanics where the physical prototyping is 100% essential. Next, if this is going to be an assignment, you need to think about what are the student deliverables going to be and how are you going to space them out over the course of several labs, the semester, the couple weeks of this project. We strongly encourage you to have multiple checkpoints 
for anything that goes longer than a couple of days. Uh, it is easy for students to get lost early on in making. It is also easy for students to underestimate uh, how much time things will take and leave stuff till the last moment. If you are having students 3D print a prototype, that takes non-zero time, and you probably don't have infinite printers where you are. And so there's going to be some scheduling involved to make this all work. So help the students with that timing by you thinking it through uh, what intermediates might they turn in so they can get partial credit if the printer fails, um, and what are reasonable deliverables. So the students need a 3D printed prototype, but they also need the CAD files that they developed that went into creating that prototype, and probably they also have a written reflection on what they learned, and also they uh, ideally have a proposal, perhaps, that they present to you early on as to why this is a thing they are going to 3D print. Reflect on those deliverables and make sure it makes sense uh, within the amount of time you have. We also want to build in assessment. Uh, a lot of folks tend to struggle, at least initially, with grading PBL in the makerspace because, well, it's not 100% right or 100% wrong. It's not the same thing as calculating the Reynolds number and knowing that we have it correct to three decimal places. So what you want to do as an instructor is visualize what a successful student project would look like and then build in the assessments that help you uh, reward the successful ones and ideally reward the ones that learned what you were looking for them to learn, even if the project itself is not 100% successful, and give less credit to uh, those who didn't put forth the effort, didn't achieve the learning outcomes. So your assessment should be tied to your course objectives and outcomes. Um, it should be tied to the making, it should be tied to the process. Uh, we encourage you here also to think about rubrics as an assessment method. And um, I personally find great success in having some elements of the project be effort-based grading. That is, the students do it or they don't. And the students do it and get feedback that helps them improve. And then some of it being more classical grading where there is a rubric that describes what high achievement is and a rubric that describes what minimum acceptable achievement is and students score somewhere on that continuum. For example, in the final project of my uh, food engineering course, students have to propose a new food product. So that's a variation on making. There's milestones along the way where I have them compile a bibliography, do a poster session on a draft of their project, give feedback to each other. These things are graded formatively. Students get feedback on uh, are they heading in the right direction? Um, how is the project going? Does it seem likely to be successful? Whereas their final written report and project prototype is graded in the more classical fashion uh, with a rubric. And there's sample rubrics included in our handout. So visualize that success. Oh, one other really important thing I want to emphasize here. You do not need to have the answer. You do not have to have done every possible permutation of this project and know exactly how it turns out. You don't have time for that, and that takes away some of the fun. What we want you to do is know that it's possible for this thing to be successful. So you don't have to 3D print every possible thing, but you have to know that it is, success is within student's reach through the mechanism of 3D printing. Okay, there's a big difference there. And this leads us nicely to the last element I wanna talk about. Critically consider what resources you're gonna offer students and what support you are going to give them. In video two, we talked about an example where students in a CAD class made a chassis for a little car. If the project was longer or had different educational outcomes, the students might have had to find and program up 
the motor for this project, but they didn't. Since this class was focused on the CAD drawing and learning the uh, limitations of what can be 3D printed and laser cut, that was something that was given to them as specifications. What might you give to the students to speed along the process or to really keep the learning focused where you need it focused? Are students going to need gears for what they're working on? Are students going to need a uh, controller system like an Arduino? Would you prefer that it was something they built from scratch? And does that serve the educational outcomes? Or would it be okay for you to give them a pile of gears or give them an Arduino with some sample code? It really depends on your objectives and how much time you are willing to let the class work on this. So please, Think about scaffolding for students as much as is appropriate. Um, maybe you're teaching capstone design, so no, it is all 100% up to them. Or you're working with first year students on something that's supposed to take two weeks, in which case <coughs> you'll want to bound the work a little more closely. Additional resources that you want to think about are access to the makerspace technologies, how are the students going to schedule that? Is there enough space and time in the makerspace for them to accomplish what you want in the time that they're going to have? Or do you need to help them by creating a schedule or hiring a TA who is going to uh, mediate disputes in the makerspace? And what other resources are available? If this is a thing done by your class, do you end up being the responsible troubleshooter for the 3D printer? Like, if it clogs or the head burns out, is that your problem? Or is your makerspace staffed by student uh, or staff technicians who watch the material and uh, ensure that everyone who's working on it is trained? Maybe you want to give the folks who work in the makerspace a heads up that you're assigning stuff there. Um, it's probably a good idea also to talk to your colleagues. If a number of you are doing makerspace based projects, they're all final projects for all the classes. And that means that 300 first year students are going to be trying to 3D print at the same time. Communication will help avoid this problem. So, Go through and brainstorm out all the different ways this could work and not work and make sure you are providing resources to students and you have talked to the other folks who might be resources for students in this case. And as I hinted at at the beginning, this is an iterative process. You don't have to do these things in the order that we have laid them out. You can start where it makes sense for you, although we recommend starting with imagining the problem. But all those other steps um, are helpful for success, but can come in whatever order you need them to. And you probably should revisit them as you work through. Another thing that we like to say in this workshop is that we work hard, we try and make the project as good as possible for the first year. We recognize this is gonna be a multi-year process. You're gonna do this project more than once for you to get good at it, for you to find out all of the things about resources, support, and materials, <coughs> and ways things can go wrong that are not obvious from the start. Even with practice, it'll still take one run through before you know where all of the bugs are. So be open to that and be prepared for that. And in fact, tell the students that this is how this is going to work. That'll help them be part of the experiment uh, as opposed to resenting the experiment. So. In our handout, you will see we have some ideas for phrasing objectives in an accessible manner. We have a framework for how you could consider the trade-off between the number of goals you want the students to achieve with this project, how much time they have, and how much support you're going to give. We really recommend, as I've mentioned before, having check-ins and milestones and lots of opportunities for feedback if you have a long project. Um, just staying at the start of the semester. Hey guys, by the end of the semester, you all should have built a car. Um, that is not as much a recipe for success as having every other week the students are turning in part of that car. 
if you have students working on a team, this is not necessarily in our handout, but there are lots of resources in the world for making and supporting good student teamwork. We don't want just one person to run away doing all of the CAD and 3D printing and other people being left to just write the report. So pull out your handout, get started in the order that works for you, and please reach out to the BFAB team for some coaching. When you have an idea and you wanna bounce it off people, you want some feedback on if your timing seems like it is likely to work, we are happy to help. So please be in touch. We'd love to hear from you. And when you're done, if you want to share this back with the community, creating one of those cards on Engineering Unleashed is a great way to do it, as is writing it up to share at the ASEE conference or in another venue appropriate to your discipline. Hope to hear from you in the future. Thanks for watching.